Hey, next session up is with Patrick McKeown, the author of The Oxygen Advantage. Um, so I'm going to add Patrick in now. Hey, Patrick. Jacko, how are you? Can yeah, you hear me okay? I'm very, very good. Thank you. The sun is shining finally again and all the better for, uh, for seeing you. Well, I've just um, gave a very, very brief intro, but I'll just do it again for anyone that might be um, seeing you for the first time or coming across stuff. We had such um, an unbelievable response to the podcast. Um, there's been a number of um, some of the coaches that we sort of know and connect with as well have started reading the book and I keep seeing like other people just like pushing it. Um, I went on Amazon last night to buy my dad for his birthday and the one with the blue cover that I've got is sold out. Um, wow. wow. So it's going That's well. great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always great to see a, a book that you spend three years, four years writing that when it gets out there, that it's embraced. It's always, of course, it's super, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Patrick, for people, this is Patrick McKeon. He, um, he wrote, is author of The Oxygen Advantage, something that I've been raving about for, for quite some time. You guys were raving about the podcast, obviously for the podcast live event, we had to have him live. And the idea with the podcast live event is to give us the opportunity to, rather than just the audible experience of listening to a podcast, is to actually like see what's going on, to actually interact, ask your questions. So put those in the comments and it allows us to actually do some of the things we're talking about rather than just describing them. So that's um, where I'd like to try and go with some of the stuff um, today. For those that haven't um, or aren't sure about what, um, you know, the Oxygen Advantage is it, the title of a book. It obviously, it's about um, the idea of oxygen. We're thinking about breath, but it is, uh, we've been coining um, a hashtag nasal gang for quite a few people. And I think, of, I think of you as like the, uh, the CEO or the guru of, of nasal gang, but um, in simple terms, um, just my first question to set the tone for people is like, why is why is nasal breathing important? And trying to go initially, just to start with, like super for you, like like you go into lots of great detail in the book. Um, I recommend anyone um, reading it. Even there's a part where you suggest like all the exercises are later, and you can go to those if you want, but recommend you understanding the science behind it because that gets you to understand what you're doing better and like I almost I totally understand we've done that with some of our programs before gone the juicy stuff is up here but the understanding yeah. is at the beginning we recommend you read that and some people skip that bit and you're missing out on all of the good stuff um but it, like from me just to help people um what resonated with me was I was on a uh, it was actually Richie Norton recommended your book to me he was just on last with me um, when I was asking him about, have you got any decent books to read? Like, I'm, I'm intrigued about, I'm questioning, am I breathing correctly? Can I breathe better? Is that an area of my life that I could maximize or improve? And so I was on that bit of a, a journey that, and he recommended the Oxygen Advantage. And the, the two things that jumped out at me uh, are what resonated with me so much in those early chapters and why you got my buy-in straight away was two things. One was this notion of getting away from the fight or flight response. And, and that's one element of, of nasal, of my understanding of why nasal is important. And then the other is getting away from this upper chest breathing. Um, Richie made a very good point earlier um, where he said, some people just aren't even aware. If you ask someone, where did you breathe from? And I've done it to people since reading the book, gone, do you think you breathe through your nose or your mouth? And some people go, oh, they know. They're like, oh, I breathe from my mouth. And other people go, or the nose. Or, but then a lot of people are like, I don't know. And I was one of those It was like, where do I breathe from? And then you start to, just that part of the process of going, asking yourself that question and throughout the day, trying to understand where you're breathing from is a, for me, was like the powerful starting point of it. Uh, but there were two things that resonated with me. But I'll shut up now and just let, in a, in a nutshell, why, set the tone of why nasal breathing is so important. Well, it's quite simple. The mouth performs zero functions in terms of breathing. If you look at the nasal cavity, I'm not sure how this is going to appear. Yes, but better than, the, better than when we did the interview. <laughs> but if you look at the mouth itself here, there is absolutely no function in the mouth here, which is regulating breathing volume, which is um, moistening it, warming it. The mouth does absolutely nothing for breathing. Yeah. It's all in the nose. So, and despite that, I actually find it amazing that... This hasn't received so much attention over the years, but the science is starting to catch up with it. There are a few professors, more so in the United States,
who are getting behind it. And in a nutshell, Jacko, it's really about if you breathe through your nose, it is tougher at the beginning, but after six to eight weeks, it gets easier because the air hunger reduces. Yeah. But when you look at the benefits of nasal breathing, you have a 10% increased pressure of oxygen in the blood. You've got increased carbon dioxide. It reduces ventilation. You've got less trauma to the airways. The nose is directly connected with the lower regions of the lungs, the diaphragm. Diaphragmatic breathing is absolutely essential for the generation of intra-abdominal pressure, for stabilization of the spine, for yeah. functional movement. Functional movement is essential for athletes that don't want to run the risk of injury. So nasal breathing is where it's at. The mouth is directly connected with the upper chest. Mouth breathing is fast breathing. It's shallow breathing. And just even if we were to look, and I'm not sure again because I can't see a camera yeah, yeah, of myself. No, but if you see here, typically with human beings because of gravity, the greatest concentration of blood is in the lower lobes of the lungs. And when we are mouth breathing, we are ventilating the upper regions. But when we breathe through the nose, we carry the air deeper throughout the lungs, but also we harness nasal nitric oxide, which redistributes the blood throughout the lungs. Nasal breathers, much less likely to have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. Um, also, in terms of COVID, it's really, really topical, and only one article has come out that was published in the Science last week. Yeah. No, if you go into a gym, or if you go into a dance class and you have a group of individuals who are mouth breathing, hard breathing, fast breathing, they are emitting a lot of water vapor into the atmosphere. So you have individuals who may be infected emitting a lot of water vapor, and then you have other individuals who are mouth breathing, and they have literally no defense from an airborne point of view. Yeah. So the nose, if you breathe in and out through your nose, your nose captures the moisture on the exhale breath. But if you breathe in through your nose and out through the mouth, there is a 42% greater water loss by mouth breathing. And that's even just looking at physical exercise. You know, I think there's so many misconceptions out there about breathing. People don't realize the impact of it. It's not just about taking the full big breath. It's nothing got to do with that. And let's look at what we can do with sleep. Let's look at what we can do with focus concentration. And let's look at what we do when we do breath holding to drive the body into an, anaer an anaerobic stage, to increase carbon dioxide, to disturb the blood acid base balance, to force the body to make adaptations to improve the buffering capacity. So with breathing, there is functional breathing, and that's our everyday breathing patterns. And I'll give you an example. Like I work with professional athletes. And last week, no, this week, um, this week I had a professional MMA fighter, yeah. a woman, a young, young, youngster woman, and gassing out too soon, disproportionate breathlessness during physical exercise, and also before she would get into the ring, she doesn't know whether she's going to gas out or not, yeah. and that creates anxiety. So it's really a vicious circle, and then when I talk to her, mouth breathing during sleep, tired all the time. And this individual has reached a professional, really high level in the sport, and her bolt score was seven seconds. Yeah. Now, yeah. you can imagine the potential with that individual. Number one is we get her sleep right. Number two is we get her functional breathing right. Number three is we get her to do breath holding, to, yeah. be, to form completely to make adaptations. And, you know, I think there are, like, we, I'm just going to say it very quickly. People think if you take a big breath that it brings more oxygen to the tissues. Big breathing. You often hear, take a deep breath, take a big breath. Big breathing will not increase the blood oxygen saturation. It won't drive up how fully loaded your hemoglobin is with oxygen. And during normal breathing, your SpO2 or the saturation of your arterial blood with oxygen is typically about 95 to 99%. If you breathe harder, you don't increase that. And if you do increase it, it might be by one or two percentage points. But the issue with breathing hard is you get rid of too much carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs. Yeah. And carbon dioxide is not just a waste gas. Back in 1904, Danish physiologist Christian Bohr discovered that the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood is what influences the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. In other words, 
it's not just to have oxygen in the blood. We need to get the oxygen out of the blood to the working muscles. Yeah. Have it driven by increased temperature of the muscle and increased carbon dioxide. Yeah. As carbon dioxide increases, blood pH drops, and the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen reduces. Our red blood cells release oxygen more readily to the tissues in the presence of carbon dioxide. Yeah, and that, and that was Patrick. Just to jump that, that was sure. one of the that was like the other when I, that was the other big thing that really jumped out at me. And I want to just unpick something because you've you've just covered like so much good stuff there. But I just want to unpick a little bit of that because there are you know there was one there was a question from um, Mont Saladin. Are we talking about breathing in and out through the nose? Like so, some people are watching and they're at we're at that point where. Um, we don't, we're not even, we're asking a question of, is it, so the answer is yes, we're talking about in and out through the nose as our, as our normal everyday breathing. The example of the MMA fighter was the, was the same as me. I was a, um, I used to play professional rugby. Um, I had a sub, a post even finishing rugby, my 5K time was um, 20, like sub, just sub 20 minutes. Um, I was fit and yet my bolt score was, probably similar it was under 10 it was under 10 seconds it was it was abysmal and by changing to some nasal breathing just not even initially just like being a bit more aware as i was talking about and actually trying to just do it a little bit more and noticing am i just out of breath and even just this realization of we'll do the bolt score with people this um i couldn't handle my body couldn't handle not or couldn't handle the, this buildup of carbon dioxide. And when, when I read the bit about the importance of carbon dioxide, it's not just a waste gas, that was a real light bulb moment for me because, because I've read the science from you to make, help me understand it, and then I felt it. I could feel when I held my breath for more than five seconds, I was like, Let some, I've, I've got to get, I've, I've, I need to start breathing again. And it was almost like panic kicking in because I couldn't handle being that far out. That, tiny amount of time without breathing and you go you've said i've heard you say this a number of times where well nothing magical is going to happen when you then go and start exercise you're going to be able to deal with all this exchange of uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide better if you can't do it well at rest so um i want to just unpick that a little bit for people and give people the chance to um uh, to, to have to have a go effectively and i think i, I bit, thought it'd be interesting to ask initially um, for people in the, if you've got any specific questions as we go along, just ask them in the, ask them in the comments um, as you have been doing, but and, and we'll, we'll answer those as we go through. But also, just give us some feedback. Are you uh, those that are listening? Are you? Do you know that you breathe through your nose? Uh, just a no, your normal everyday breathing. Are you aware that actually you tend to breathe through your mouth? Or third option is, I actually I've, I haven't ever thought about it. They're the, almost the three types, of, they're the sort of three answers generally when we're asking ourselves, how are we breathing? So let us know um, in the comments. How are you breathing during sleep? Do you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning? Yeah, we'll get, we'll get on to taping our mouth at night, but I, didn't, I thought, I thought we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we won't go too hard at people too early doors. Um, so body boot camp is a more through the mouth, so just starting to get that awareness. Splonky whoosh, mostly mouth, so people are... I generally breathe, uh, so Zerd generally breathe through a nose. So people being aware, I'm sure there'll be a ton of people listening that are also not aware, but we're going to bring, heighten that um, awareness and now. Um, and I thought it would be good to do, um, just explain what that bolt score is, because some, yeah, someone's asking already. Explain what that bolt score is. You've already talked about the buildup of, or the need for carbon dioxide uh, to allow for more oxygen, because it's true that we want oxygen, we need oxygen for the muscle as a, as to help with the fuel for muscles to, to work. But what, you, what the, the understanding of the science is that without any carbon dioxide presence, that exchange is not as effective as it could be, or it's necessary yeah. for it to happen. Um, and therefore, our ability to deal with carbon dioxide buildup is a good marker of our level of cardiovascular fitness and, and efficiency of breathing. Yeah. Bolt score is breath hold time. And breath hold time is a measurement of dyspnea or breathlessness. Since 1975, 
because what determines how hard and fast you breathe during physical exercise is influenced by your sensitivity to the gas carbon dioxide. Yeah. And if you were overly sensitive to the buildup of CO2 in the blood, your breathing is harder and fast. We don't, the primary stimulus to breathe is not oxygen. It's only, it's only when we go up into altitude that our oxygen in the blood drops by about half does oxygen drive our breathing. The primary stimulus to breathe is carbon dioxide. And how sensitive we are to that gas will determine how hard we breathe during physical exercise. Yeah. So athletes who are breathing have a habit of everyday breathing if their breathing is upper chest and just that little bit faster. And it's not that they are having a panic attack. It's not that they are having an asthma attack, but it's just that their everyday breathing is just a little bit faster, a little bit harder, up in the upper chest, and that everyday breathing translates into dysfunctional breathing during physical exercise. Which, just it's, passing on that, just there are some stuff, because a lot of people are, in the, are doing uh, some of the stuff in calisthenics, like handstands and things that require good overhead mobility, that if we're very dominant from breathing from our upper chest, like, all day every day that has an impact on our rib cage that has an impact on our like thoracic uh, mobility so extension which is important for overhead rotation as an ability it has an effect on our uh, around the first rib that can be really restricted for the shoulder there's a whole host of things that go into it not just from a cardiovascular point of view as well which i think that was one of the that to be honest that was one of the things that i was interested in because i knew about the potential effect of poor upper chest breathing on sort of shoulder mechanics and that was one of my drivers to try and understand a little bit more about it so i think whether it doesn't matter whether someone's interested in both or someone's interested more on the cardiovascular side of things i mean my 5k time went from just below 20 minutes to 19 16 in the course of about five weeks um so yeah. it has that massive effect but then also you're going to do some stuff that's that is going to help to actually loosen up potentially some stuff around your neck, particularly your thoracic spine and your overhead or your, and your shoulder mobility as well. You're going to get those things um, yeah. as a benefit as well. Well, like it's, respirate, it's not just about respiration. It's all, also about functional movement. And yeah. individuals with lower back pain tend to have dysfunctional breathing patterns. You can imagine we need, it translates the whole way through the body, right? Yeah. And, you know, we need to die from for that stabilization um, and with diaphragmatic breathing is having a normal exhalation where the diaphragm moves back up to its resting position. Because it's when the diaphragm, when we have a normal exhalation, then we can have a normal inhalation. And when the diaphragm moves back up to its resting position, this increases the zone of apposition, which is the distance from the height of the diaphragm down to the lower ribs. And this in turn then is increasing intra-abdominal pressure. But coming back to it, like in terms of the science, Professor Kiesel, published a paper in 2018 and looking at 51 subjects, healthy subjects, and only five of those, 10% of them, had normal breathing patterns. And, you know, this is very common in the population, but it's more common in some subgroups than others. So a Cochrane review said it was about 9.5% of the population. But with asthma, in, another, in other papers, it's about 30%. But with people with anxiety and panic disorder, it's about 80%. And the other thing is, Jacko, and I've only started going down the route of female breathing is significantly different than male breathing, right. especially for, for younger young women who are having the monthly cycle. And we're talking about the luteal phase where hyperventilation kicks in. And hyperventilation is a natural reaction to the change of hormones, progesterone. This in turn is increasing breathing. This is lowering carbon dioxide in the blood by up to 25%. This is increasing pain, increasing anxiety, increasing fatigue. Now, most studies don't, most studies on breathing don't differentiate between male and female breathing. I as a breathing instructor for 18 years, because I'm a typical man, I overlooked female breathing. And the more I go down this, considering that 50% of my students over the years were females, and yet we weren't reflecting the change in performance of a female during, during just times of monthly cycle. So hormones do influence breathing. You know, and we, we have to bear in mind that if we are in a habit of over-breathing, yes, it does influence activity of the mind. You cannot have a calmness and stillness of the mind 
you cannot be in the zone so readily. You don't have a good night's sleep. Your energy levels, your focus, your mood, your concentration is all impacted. Yeah. But we have to bear in mind that with breathing, the degree of breathlessness consumes oxygen. As we sit here now, about 2 to 3% of our oxygen consumption is going to support the breathing muscles. Yeah. If we go for a walk, fast walk, it's about 5 6%. If we go for more intense exercise, it's about 10%. If we do maximum physical exercise, it's 15%. But if we have chronic hyperventilation, that our breathing is in excess of our normal metabolic requirements, the VO2, the oxygen consumption going to support breathing muscles, is as high as 30%. There is a cost associated with breathing hard. And this is good in terms of when you first switch from mouth to nose breathing, of course there is an air hunger. And there's a degree of suffocation. And the reason being is because the nose exerts a resistance to your breathing that's two to three times that of the mouth. Nose breathing is slowing down breathing. And with that, with a slowing down of the breath and a reduction to breathing volume, carbon dioxide increases in the blood. And carbon dioxide is the stimulus to breathe. So when you go for exercise, initially with your mouth closed, the CO2 in the blood is higher you feel a greater air hunger. But if you continue doing all of your physical exercise with the mouth closed, the body is forced to make adaptations to tolerate carbon dioxide. Yeah. Now that translates into reduced breathlessness. And only one study, would you believe, I find it amazing that professors of exercise science have missed this. Yeah. When you look at the physiology, how on earth are they, how on earth are they missing the elephant in the room? And I talk about that because even the professional athletes that I work with, and I work with not just, of course, professional athletes, five-year-old kids right up to people in their 70s and 80s. Yeah. But how on earth are we missing breathing? That we are looking at nutrition, we're looking at psychology, strength and conditioning. Yeah. And yet the athletes who maybe have a tendency towards anxiety and panic, a genetic predisposition towards harder and faster breathing, anybody with any sort of sensitivity towards exercise induced bronchoconstriction so those individuals who get frequent colds they have inflammation of their lungs their chest feels tight they feel they're not getting enough air because that's going to hold back progress and if i look at george dallam's paper he looked at he spent 10 years sorry he spent two years trying to recruit athletes and he's a professor of exercise sports in the united states yeah he did a study. He says, I'm going to have athletes breathe through their nose for six months only during physical exercise. And I'm going to measure how do they perform after six months. When they switched from mouth to nose breathing, when they were tested at six months, they had 22% less ventilation, nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. The fraction of expired oxygen was less, nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. In other words, they weren't bringing in oxygen, that oxygen during a round trip, and they blown back out that oxygen so much. With nasal breathing, your body utilizes oxygen better. With nasal breathing, your recovery post-physical exercise is better. It hasn't been studied. Yeah. Many people have told me over the years, they go out for a run with their mouth closed, and they don't have the same lactic acid buildup. They don't have the same, you know, in terms of that recovery that's needed, that they, they fit, they yeah. feel very following physical exercise. Yeah. Coming back to your question, the BOLD score, Kiesel looked at 51 subjects and he looked at breathing from a biochemical point of view, a biomechanical point of view and a psychophysiological point of view. He concluded that the easiest way to screen for breathing pattern disorders in the general population and athlete population was breath hold time. Now he didn't call it BOLD score, but it's exactly yeah. BOLD score. You see the description. Yeah, and I'll explain what it is. Yeah, let, explain it, and then we'll and then we'll do we'll all do one together and see how we get on. Yeah. So you take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose. You pinch your nose, you hold your nose, and you time it in seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe. And when you let go, your breathing should be relatively normal. Yeah. So it's not the length of time of a maximum breath hold, but it's the length of time that you can hold your breath for comfortably. Yeah. And um, 
So I suppose you know you want we to be sitting. Be finishing. <sighs> and, and, and yeah, exactly. Have it like that, yeah. Because if you hold your breath for as long as you can, it's influenced by willpower and determination. Yeah, yeah. So, Whereas you're I looking would... at that first inclination um, to to want to breathe. You might you, you might feel. Um, what do you describe some of those respiratory muscles just like well, when, kicking when in? You stop, when you stop breathing, at some point, the brain is going to react yeah. to the fact that you stop breathing. And the brain reacts by sending a message to the diaphragm and to the intercostals. Yeah. So the diaphragm breathing muscle, you can have involuntary movements of the diaphragm breathing muscle as a result of it. Or you might notice it in the throat. Is it the, so, is it the, is it the, the barring bar, bar receptors in the brain? In terms of the respiratory center, it's, in, it's located in the most primitive part of the brain because, of course, we've been breathing since day dot. And in the medulla itself, there are key, central chemoreceptors which are monitoring primarily carbon dioxide and blood pH. Yeah. And that's why carbon dioxide is the primary drive to breathe. Yeah. And then there are peripheral chemoreceptors located at the angle of the jaw. They're monitoring carbon dioxide and oxygen to a lesser extent. So they are the secondary yeah. regulations of breathing. So, I you know... I reading, reading in your book that, they're, that you're literally almost... You have a... By, by over-breathing and upper chest breathing too much all the time, that you, we change that, like, that, that dial, effectively, of when those receptors are telling you to breathe and by doing some of the exercises that we'll go through, like, we're basically trying to reset that, that they then... That message gets sent. And you feel the difference. You're like... You sat there and you're like, yeah, I can actually just, I don't need to take, I'm not, I don't have this urge um, to take a, take a breath. Can we try, can we, can we get people yeah, to Yeah, yeah, I've no time or nothing. So people, I'll do the description. So. I'll, 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 I'll go on the cool. timer. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, you, 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 uh, you give the description. When I pinch my nose, I'm going to hit the, uh, I'm going to hit the okay. timer. And the people, people join in with us. Okay. So whenever you're ready, yeah. take a normal breath in through your nose and a normal breath out through your nose. Pinch your nose with your fingers and time it in seconds. Just continue relaxing into the body and keep holding your breath until you feel the first definite desire to breathe or the first involuntary movement of the breathing muscles or the first stress to breathe. And when you let go, your breath should be fairly normal. And that looks as if it was normal. So that's 21 seconds. Now, Kiesel's... Been... Off. My PB's 30. I've been... Uh, a, 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 good, a, good, um, a good lesson has been, it's the same as anything that we train, your respiratory muscles, the your mechanics of it. If you don't... Like, if I, if I stop doing pull-ups, I get worse. I'm not going to get... They're not going to... I'm not going to still be good at them. And it's the same... It's the same thing. I've worked really hard to get myself up to up to 30 and then I've just slackened off a little bit and you notice and you notice yeah. the difference. Stops. Yeah, but also I don't always think it's good to measure both score live because psychologically it will influence the both score. However, like if you look at Kiesel's study, he said that 25 seconds, if you're above 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing is not present. Yeah, so 25, 25. is a good marker to get above. Yeah. 25 is a good mark. And people put in, the, people put, put in the, if anyone's done it there and timed it, let us know what you, uh, what you actually managed to get. Be interested to see what people, how people did. So, Jacko, then, in order to improve bowl score, it's essential to start off breathing through the nose, but about 30% of your listeners are going to have nasal obstruction. Yeah. Now, you can decongest your nose holding the breath. Yeah, oh, I love this one, by the way. This is, unlike the difference this makes is unbelievable, because as you said, when you... Uh, and I've had this, someone, someone said, a friend of ours, um, they were like, they tried to, they, they managed to probably run about 10 meters just through the nose and that was it. Like this, so when you're, and like I was, it was, as you described now, uh, sorry, as you described at the beginning, if when you try to breathe in through your nose, because someone's asking when running, should you breathe through your nose and out through your mouth? And actually what you're, from, from the techniques that you're talking about, about resetting those effectively resetting those uh, receptors so that you can breathe your normal everyday breathing in the background. We're trying to encourage it to be in and out through the nose. And yes. when you first try and do that exercising, 
let them, or even if you just first try to do and we'll get onto it, the breathe light to breathe right and stuff that you yes. do. Even when you try to do that, that can be difficult. But certainly when you try to do running, and we have to apply, apply the principle, like anything we're going to change, of like progressive overload. You cannot go all out and suddenly, you might have to progressively like build up slowly. You might have to start yeah. running very yeah. slowly to be able to build up to doing it. And it will feel, um, yeah, your nose might feel completely boxed. Mine would just stream with a snot and it literally didn't feel like I could get it in. I'd end up breathing so hard through my nose that it would like, cl like I would, it would like close on itself and then no, yeah, I'd yeah. end up yeah. breathing through yeah. your But it, it changes. I feel like now, and I'm still, my CDC there, my box score is anywhere between low 20s to mid 20s on a normal day. Um, but I feel like now I can pretty much do any exercise just in and out through my nose. But I yeah. did not feel like that when and it's been and it's been a while and you do have to work at it like anything but it massively changes um and at the start feeling um congested is a problem and like not literally you you don't feel like you can get the you just like it doesn't feel like you can do it you're like i can't get the air in and out through my nose fast enough it's just it's blocked yeah. and so this is going to take people through i just yeah. wanted to Set that so I'll show, you, I'll show yeah. you the exercise, but I'm just going to make a quick comment. Yeah. Your ability to nasal breathe during physical exercise is going to influence by is going to be influenced by two things. One is your bolt score. As your bolt score increases, minute ventilation reduces. Yeah. So people who are breathing hard, like for example, if I see somebody and they're walking and they're breathing hard during their walking or gassing out an athlete. Number one is I see their breathing during rest is typically faster, upper chest, no natural pauses following exhalation. And their bowl score could be ranging anything from six, seven seconds up to about 16, 17 seconds. That individual gas is out too soon. And I know strength and conditioning coaches might say it's due to poor condition. It's not. We have the fittest individuals who are training professionally, and yet it's their everyday breathing that's holding them back. They are mouth breathing during the day, they are fast upper chest breathing during the day. Their mouth to open during sleep. Now, the second thing which determines your ability to do physical exercise with your mouth closed is the size of your nose. So if you have a compromised nose like mine, you probably need to get a nasal dilator. So, for example, if you do this, put one finger here and one finger here. And if you just gently prise the nostrils, it's called the cottle maneuver, and it helps open up the nose. And that will also help to prevent nasal valve collapse. So we're currently designing a nasal dilator for sports to help open it up. So the nose unblocking exercise, and the reason I think it's really important, because I was a chronic mouth breather for 20 years. I was highly strung. My sleep was always impacted. And I used to be exhausted. And then going into school and trying to get grades exhausted. You can decongest your nose in five minutes holding your breath. Don't do this exercise if you're pregnant. Don't do this exercise if you have any serious medical conditions. But let's give it a go. Do you want to give it a go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this. So can I have you stand up? Yeah. Are we, are we walking? I'm going to have you walk on the spot. Okay. So if you take a normal breath in whenever you're ready. Yeah. Jacko, to open up the nose. Well, first of all, you can block one nostril and breathe through it. And then block the other nostril and breathe through it. So you get an idea of how open and closed the nose is. To decongest the nose, take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose, pinch your nose, hold your nose, start walking, holding the breath. Start walking. Now go into a jog. Go into a jog holding the nose. And keep going, holding your breath. Keep going, keep pushing, keep going, keep pushing. Until a pretty strong air hunger, let go. So maybe the first couple will do easy. Let go there and breathe in through your nose. Let go there, yeah? And typically, if you hold your breath for more than 30 seconds, your nose opens up. Mm, How does yeah. it happen? Ear, nose, and throat doctors are not exactly sure. Oh, really? I gave it to 150 ENTs in Madrid in 2019. I was in Madrid, it was, it was in conference room. I had them all do it, and then I started seeing them looking at each other. They weren't aware 
that holding of the breath and opening up the nose. But it also increases blood flow to the brain. So let's do it again. I want to do the first couple easy, and then I push it. Take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose. Pinch your nose, hold your nose, start walking, start jogging. And just jog gently as you hold your breath. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. So let go with that one there. So we do the first two easy, because I think it's always kind of better. Uh, see, I've got more than that, Patrick. I've got a lot more than that. So the next few we're going to do more stronger. Yeah. I think it's always better to do the first two a little bit easier. So yeah. this exercise is about upregulation. Yeah. We do slow breathing to downregulation, but this one here is about upregulation. So it's not just going to open up your nose. I'll talk about what it's doing. Yeah. So let's go again. This and one push, the, yeah? And the, the difference, the bulk score is just when you then, it's not a maximal hold at all, exactly. whereas this yeah. is one we are looking to, to push in. On the bulk score, yeah. it's this inclination to breathe, whereas this is we're actually looking to make an adaptation. Yeah. But there is a correlation. If you see that graph there, if the bowl score, so yeah. this now is the maximum breathlessness test that I'm having you do, a slight variation of it. Yeah. And if your bowl score is 20, 20 seconds, your maximum breathlessness test is 40 to 60 paces yeah. that you're able to hold your nose. For. So, let's, so what I'd like you to do, Try this Jacko. With us, people. Try this with us. Try it, of course. Take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose, pinch your nose, hold your nose, start walking, but count your paces. Count the paces. Now walk faster. Now go into a jog. And jog faster. And keep relaxing into the body. You will feel involuntary contractions of your breathing muscles. Keep going, keep pushing, keep going. Keep relaxing into the body. When the air hunger gets pretty strong, let go, but then minimize your breathing for six breaths at the end. So when the air hunger gets strong, let go, breathe in through your nose, perfect, and minimal breathing for six breaths. Get your breathing under control. Now, that exercise will open up your nose, even if you have a head cold. Now, with a head cold, the bolt score drops, and the nose, after a head cold, the nose can get congested again. You literally but, feel the difference of the air being able to... Yeah. Come in and out through the nose, it's phenomenal. Yeah, no, it's, and it, like I've used that exercise with at least seven and a half, eight thousand people. And <laughs> I've been able to get them breathing through the nose without surgery, without nasal steroids, without, without antihistamine. If you have a stuffy nose, you don't just have a stuffy nose, your sleep is impacted and your exercise performance is impacted. Yeah. To yeah. want to test your know, the nose, you have to do that exercise about five or six times. Yeah. But there's more stuff happening when you do that breath hold. Your lower airways are also opening up. So people with asthma, it will greatly help. Anybody with asthma or exercise-induced bronchial constriction, you will continue to have exercise-induced bronchial constriction until the bolt score is 25 seconds or the maximum breathlessness test is 60 paces. And... You know, when we have athletes doing a warm-up, say they're doing a warm-up for 15 to 20 minutes, I have them do slow breathing with lateral expansion and contraction of the diaphragm to help with anxiety and to bring a stillness to the mind to improve focus. But then they are too relaxed. Then I have them do two easy breath holds during the warm-up and five strong breath holds. And then I have them do a couple of bigger breaths to get rid of the, the carbon dioxide if they're too acidic. Yeah. And the athlete then, so we bring them from a, we down regulate them first to calm the mind, and then we up regulate them. Breath tolling is an up regulation. And with that also, you, during training, you are dropping your blood oxygen saturation, that you are achieving generally severe hypoxia and high carbon dioxide to disturb the blood acid base balance, to improve the buffering capacity, probably inside the muscle compartment to delay lactic acid and fatigue. And repeated sprintability in rugby, this was tested about two years ago, a paper by Wurons looking at 21 professional rugby union players in Australia. They divided them into two groups, 11 individuals in one group, 10 in the other. Four weeks of practice. So for four weeks, one group did high intensity interval training with, their, with normal breathing. 
and the other group did 40 meter sprints with breath holding. They measured repeated sprint ability after four weeks. Yeah. The group who were doing high intensity interval training, they had no improvements in repeated sprint ability before exhaustion. The group who were doing breath holding during the 40 meter sprints, their repeated sprint ability increased from 9.1 to 14.9 before exhaustion. So in other words, they could do 14.9 reps yeah. of 40 meter sprints with a 30 second, with a departure every 30 seconds before exhaustion. Now these are elite, professional, well-trained rugby union players during competitive season to get a gain in repeated sprint ability, which is a measurement of performance in sports. It's, you know, to get that gain, the reason being is because breathing has been totally overlooked in sports performance. Yeah. And I think primarily is because there is misinformation out there. It kind of had bad connotations in terms of it was seen to be the domain of the guys, tree huggers, or the guys going around with the Opal Sandal Brigade, you know, and it was kind of this airy fairy thing. But when well, we think, tackle the breathing, I think one of the things that you've that, that's so good about what you've done is because you're the oxygen advantage. It's sort of it, it isn't necessarily when you read the book. It's not like just about sports performance and for improving your sport, but it's you get in the buy-in from that area of people, and I just I'm seeing it just like grow out more and more and more. And um, I mean, there's. There's a number of there's a number of questions. Um, uh, Skatey kid said the book is amazing. It's changed my life, and that's not a question. But I just thought that's that's the type of thing that you need to be hearing because that is the impact um, that you're having on people. Uh, Oliver Harrison asked about whether he should be breathing in and out through his nose when running. We've uh, we covered and explained that. Um, same for another someone else. Um, there are number of, there's not many people getting over 25 on their bolt score, which that was the, the level that people, that you were saying as a, as, as a marker to get to. Um, there was a number of people, we, met, we mentioned taping through the, the, taping the mouth at night. So Craig Rowles is saying the mouth taping is a game changer at night. Um, there was a number of people, the podcast collective, mouth taping at night. Um, Thankfully, I met Patrick at least five years ago. Still a bit far behind my goal, but the bolt score is, is working on the bolt score. So, Paul, um, Ankovis, um, Dave Fosterer, is there any physiological difference between basic breath hold and, for example, the nose and blocking exercise? No, the, the nose and blocking exercise that we do is we always do breath holds after an exhalation, a normal exhalation. Yeah. And the reason being is if you breathe in and hold your breath, there is more stress in the lungs, but also you're unlikely to drop your blood oxygen saturation. So like people, people do high intensity interval training to stimulate anaerobic glycolysis, but the only issue with it is it's traumatic and it can increase the risk of injury if overdone. When you do high intensity interval training, your blood oxygen saturation will drop down to about 91, 90, 93, 91%. You're yeah. barely hypoxic. Yeah. With breath holding, even during what you were doing there, if we measured blood, blood oxygen saturation during that time, you're likely to go into severe hypoxia, about 85%. Yeah. So we're able to achieve a much greater degree of anaerobic glycolysis to force the body to make those adaptations, but you can do it during jogging, no trauma. And yeah. the other aspect is you are putting a load onto the breathing muscles and nasal breathing helps to maintain diaphragmatic strength. And the one thing about diaphragmatic strength is that if the breathing muscles fatigue, blood is stolen from the legs to feed the diaphragm. That breathing is one of those absolutely vital functions. And if breathing is not up to par, other functions of the body will be sacrificed. And you feel, so, I mentioned to you before about a feel, a feeling that when you do some of those maximal breath holds when walking for steps, yes. your legs, you go, you, when you do go to your limit, um, you, do, you, you feel that your legs go a bit sort of... Um, yes. thing. Yeah. You mentioned about um, diaphragmatic breathing at the start. We, you showed your, um, the diagram of um, the, the lung, trying to fill the lungs from lower down and the, the fact that diaphragmatic breathing so deep deep breathing as in that sense of it rather than just taking yeah. a big breath being a difference yeah. and the nasal breathing yeah and the nasal breathing 
stimulates more, is that the right word? More, um, more breathing into the, so nasal breathing, more diaphragmatic breathing, which helps yeah. you fill up the yeah. lungs more as yeah. opposed to the shallow breathing that comes from yeah. the chest. That's okay. one of those reasons if you look to at, be breathing. From if, the you look down, if you look down at your chest and take a breath through your mouth, when you breathe through the mouth, you'll typically see that the movement is tend to be upper chest breathing. Yeah. And upper chest breathing is totally inefficient and totally uneconomical. And the reason being is because mouth breathing and fast breathing, there's so much more air wasted in dead space yeah. that the air that you're taking into the body isn't getting down into the small air sacs in the lungs. Now, what I would like to qualify is that when we think about functional breathing, everyday breathing, I look at it in terms of three different um, dimensions. One is the biochemistry. And it's very common for people who have poor breathing patterns to have cold hands. And the reason being is because it's not just that the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is stronger when we breathe too hard, but also when we breathe that little bit faster than what we should be breathing, our blood vessels constrict. So we have 70,000 miles of, of blood vessels throughout the body. And if we are breathing faster and harder, our blood vessels are constricting. And that's why cold hands and cold feet and brain fog is often common. So the first dimension of breathing is when we have people put, say, one hand in their chest, one hand just above their navel. And I have them tune into their breathing. And I have them really slow down the speed of the air as they take it in and out of their nose to the point of an air hunger. We get them to deliberately underbreed for a period of time. The benefits of that is that when you underbreed, carbon dioxide increases in the blood. The body is very sensitive to an increase of CO2. You feel air hunger. But even though you feel air hunger, your blood vessels start opening up. You start to feel internally an increased temperature. And also, it's a great way to activate the body's parasympathetic response. You will notice increased water saliva in the mouth in about three to four minutes. I'm often amazed by individuals who have anxiety, they have panic disorder, and even individuals with depression. Very few people is talking about changing the respiratory physiology to improve blood flow to the brain and to improve the functioning of the autonomic nervous system in terms of increasing yeah. the vagus nerve, improving heart rate variability, improving respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And also, Jacko, yes. sleep. Sleep is overlooked. You can't have quality sleep unless you breathe through your nose and your nose and lower breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, come together. Yeah. No, and those, just when you mentioned there about um, parasympathetic, like those of us that are trying to maximize like recovery, I've yes. talked before about that upper chest breathing, feeling like in, stuck in that fight or flight mode that actually that we're trying to, when we're trying to rest and digest and when we're trying to recover, the breath being a great way to stimulate that part of the, the process and, and using the breath to slow down and down regulate. Um, so, so important. We've got Do Dr. Sally Bell is actually going to be, she's a functional health doctor. She's going to be on, she's the next guest on, but she's been watching and she said she's seen great results in her clinic practice with asthma patients and the patients mm -hmm. with mental health issues. And she's now going to uh, said it's fascinating about the female health. So she's going to start uh, looking into that. So you, uh, you're inspiring. Um, well, doctor, I, I'll have a new book out. I've just written 120,000 words and I've no idea where it's going to stop. It's probably one of those 150,000 word books. But the female, there's 14,000 words devoted to female breathing. Yeah. And yeah, so apologies for, from me as a man to the female population. How on earth did we miss that one? But in any event, hey. trying to catch up. But you're doing yeah, exactly. Stephen, uh, Torino, Patrick, you are my hero. Love your book and research. Been taping the mouth for over... Um, a year. I'm just going to have a look at the final last few minutes. Um, I'm just going to look at some of these questions. If you just, um, maybe if the last thing that we cover being um, that nasal, because you've covered there like the breathe, light to breathe, right type of, um, like slow. I down. only covered one dimension. Right, okay. So it's about air hunger, which is biochemistry, but then we go into cadence breathing with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs. Lateral contraction and expansion of the lower ribs is to target the biomechanics. And then we change the cadence down to 5.5 and 6 breaths per minute 
because it's the optimal cadence of the breath to practice to influence the autonomic nervous system. So bodily systems disturbed by stress, in order to improve and stimulate the vagus nerve and to stimulate the baroreceptors to increase heart rate variability, and heart rate variability is a measure of vagal tone, to get a balance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic. So with functional breathing, when I'm working with somebody now, I don't just look at the biochemistry, but I'm also looking at the biomechanics and the cadence. And here's the thing, Jacko. Yeah. For 16 years, I was stuck looking just at the biochemistry. The yoga instructor is looking mainly at the biomechanics, but they're not looking at the biochemistry. They're not looking at cadence. And the heart rate variability instructor is looking at cadence breathing, nothing about the biomechanics and nothing about the biochemistry. And the one thing about breathing is we have to look at all three dimensions and we also have to consider our breathing during sleep. Now, I want to show you this. This is our own idea. I don't know if I showed it to you the last time. It's not, I'm not trying to plug it around. But taping of the mouth is really, really important. Anybody who wakes up with a dry mouth in the morning, they are not likely to have that deep and refreshing sleep that we all need. And one of the slides that I use in my book is, this, is, this isn't a, the book that's out there, but this is a book for our instructors. If you see this, the, connect, the, the relationship between the emotions, sleep and breathing. Yeah. If our breathing is off, our sleep is, is off. Sleep quality is reduced. If sleep quality is reduced, we're not going to have a calm mind. But if we have an agitated mind, we cannot sleep well because we can't switch off. And if we have poor sleep, it can impact our breathing. And if we are stressed, it impacts our breathing. And if our breathing is impacted, it causes and contributes to stress. So the taping, you could get 3M one-inch micropore tape at a local chemist. Um, and it'll work better for beards. But this one here, I developed it originally for children because I needed children. Like I've seen one of the comments there, the yeah, dentist. I'm asking about children, yeah. Mouth breeders have got greater increased risk of halitosis, um, gum disease, dental cavities, dry mouth. Um, saliva is a protective agent in it within the mouth. And if we have the mouth open, our mouth is dry. We are more dehydrated. So this tape is more suitable for people who would be anxious about wearing the tape. It's stretchable. We stretch it by 30%. And it's the, it's the elastic tension of the tape yeah. which brings the lips together. That encourages it to be closed, but you can open so you're not going to panic at night. I just went straight gaffer tape when I went, I'm, <laughs> I'm the type of guy, if I'm doing it, I'm doing it. <laughs> well, this is Jack, I have a few questions when I pull the gaffer tape out as we got in bed. <laughs> but, you know, what? it was, yeah. I started taping in 1998. It totally changed my life. Yeah. And we have that's, people that's come. What people are saying on the comments. That's what people are yeah. saying. And it's not just because it, it was just, it was one of those things. I was waking up feeling exhausted. I was snoring. I had obstructive sleep apnea, asthma, nasal congestion. You, you don't just have asthma. And, you know, within your population, at least 10% of the people listening to us here, yeah. they have problems with their lungs. And they don't just have problems with their lungs, they're tired. Sleep is also impacted with asthma. Yeah. Um, right. There's a number of questions. We need. We'll get. We're gonna. We're gonna end up getting um, cut off. It doesn't let us go longer than uh, an hour. And um, but there are some questions. People ask it. So Patrick's book is called The Oxygen Advantage. You can get it on Amazon. The um, Oxygen Advantage is his Instagram page. I've put the link in there. You can click straight on it. You can buy the book from him there. The tape that you've just shown is tape that you've de your your team has yeah. developed, so you can buy that from your. It's website. called Myo Myo Tape because it was mainly developed for dentistry and orthodontics. What's the web? Is the website OxygenAdvantage dot com? It's Myo Tape M Y O Tape dot com, and I'm not sure if we have it on Oxygen Advantage. It's only a new product, um, so we're just putting it out there. But my, so Myo Tape dot com. M Y O Myo Tape, yeah. Yeah. MYOtape.com. Right. Um, mate, thank you so much for uh, being part of today. We couldn't have had the, our, our favorite guest without having you on. So, um, thank yeah. you so much for taking the time.
Um, even just seeing the comments from people that are like, you know, you've changed their life and that's, um, yeah, anything that, well, co like congratulations to the, the amazing work that you're doing and anything that we can do to help to keep spreading um, the message. It feels like it's getting out there into the sport and fitness world, which is great. And then it will, that it's, it's a, I think there's a great opportunity that that will then start to filter out into um the general population because this is something that's so simple for everyone to do um even if like your, your takeaway message from this is your first experience of it just ask yourself that question throughout the day where am i breathing from is it my nose or is it my mouth do i notice the difference that when it's mouth it's here and when it's nose it's lower down from my diaphragm just start that process um, and if you then convince if then you want you're intrigued and want to know more Buy the Oxygen Advantage book. It's like nine quid or something on Amazon. It's absolutely, it's a no-brainer. Um, and read all of it. Don't skip to the exercises because the science and the understanding of the beginning is so, so important and definitely worth a read. It's a super, it's a, one of the fastest books I've ever read because it was just, it was easy to read. It's, it's uh, yeah. And I'm not good at reading. <laughs> I've got to see it English at, at school. Um, so, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much because it's this is how the awareness spreads for us. Yeah. Uh, and it's tremendous to see it getting out there. So thanks a lot for that, Jacko. Super. No worries, man. Pleasure. Um, thank you, man. Dave Forrester, is, is, I'm off to read the book again. <laughs> Good lad. Uh, <laughs> right. Thank you so much um, for coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, I'm sure we will be in contact again very, very soon. But if anyone's got any questions, head over to Auction Advantage and you can obviously... Get the book, get the tape, ask Patrick any questions on his Instagram there. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Guys. Bye.